we're going to be in John chapter 1 today. Um, as we kind of begin our journey of spending time together in the Word, as we walk through this year, um, our church has taken a challenge. And that challenge is, is that we are going to read through the New Testament together this year and slow down and really choose to find Jesus throughout the New Testament. What can it tell us about him that, one, we never knew before, or two, that we need to be renewed in? So as we read the text together, I hope you'll take that challenge with us. Um, if you haven't grabbed a copy of Reading Through the New Testament uh, this year as a church, you can grab that in the foyer, or you can go to our church website, and you can find it in PDF form and still read along with us. Um, as a staff, we're taking on the challenge of always preaching from the previous week's reading, which means we are going to go back together each week and look at Scripture that we've read. So as we go through this year, please spend the time to read and prepare your heart. Before we get to the text, I want to do a practice with you that we've done before. And that's this. I want to pray that our hearts would listen to God's word beyond a pastor preaching and that we would hear from the Holy Spirit himself this morning. So if you do me a favor, open your palms up. Remember, my friend Bob Goff says that when people are on the stands, they tend to not lie when their palms are up. So he has them sit palms up. And let's go before the Lord together. Let's start by praying that God would mend our hearts and prepare us to listen to him this morning. Would you just pray that prayer right where you are? Next, would you pray for those in this room that know Christ and that don't know Christ, that today they would hear from the Lord as well? Next, would you pray for me as I preach this morning that I would handle the word of God truthfully? And last, let's just spend a few moments praising Jesus for who he is. Lord Jesus, with palms up, we declare our need for you, how great you are, and how desperately we want to hear from you today. So cleanse us, prepare us, Lord, to worship you even as we spend time in your word. May it change us and lead us closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So this morning, I want to tell you of a dilemma that we ran into. A few weeks back, um, I invited our youngest life groups in adult ministry to a lunch. I asked them to come so that we could start preparing for reaching young adults in the life of our church. And so I, I just threw out a, an ask. I said, would you RSVP and tell me that you'll come to this lunch? thinking in my head that we would have about 40. As of today, we have over 100 signed up to come to that lunch after church today. I say that to say, as we speak, we have wonderful volunteers and a, a chunk of our staff that are upstairs in our fellowship hall space, our, our Crossroads class, preparing and setting up tables and cooking and preparing as we speak because God is starting something in the life of our church that we didn't expect. Um, I ask you, if you are not a part of that lunch, that as you do go to lunch, would you pray for that time? Would you pray over those that are in the room? Would you ask that God would inspire them, that he would lead them, and that the next season of, the church of, our, uh, season of our church life would be fruitful? Would you pray that God would use you in a mighty way to also help in that endeavor? We believe God has still a lot to do with the church at Quell Creek. So if you believe it, I'm asking that you start praying for it. Pray deeply that God would move in that time and beyond as we begin to focus our attention on reaching young people and young couples and young adults at the church at Quell Creek. Um, there's going to come a time where I'm going to come to you and ask you to step in and help. Your prayer should be, Lord, prepare me to do so. And when that question comes, you're ready. Um, I believe God's about to do something awesome. And it's made us pivot. I really believe today when we get to that lunch, there's going to be over 120 in the room. 
to ask God for 40 and to get about 120, tell me my God can't do something. It's amazing. I'm a golfer. It's one of the identifiers I will say that I am. I'm very thankful that the Lord has shown me a, a place in a game that I can tee up my frustrations and hit them down the, down the way. Now, it may not be straight, but I'm hitting my frustrations down, hopefully, the fairway. But in that effort, over time, I have gathered up some yardage books. And what a yardage book is, is courses that are elevated produce books. And they, they tell you, like, here is number seven at the Payne Stewart Golf Course there in Missouri. It tells you exactly the yardage to different places on that particular, uh, that particular hole. So it tells me that it's this many yards to the front bunker. So if I was playing, I could say, I don't want to hit it that short because I may end up in trouble. So when I grab a yardage book, it tells me how far I should plan to play that particular shot. Now I'll tell you this. I have four of those books up here with me today. Um, Payne Stewart Golf Club, Harbor Town, uh, there in Hilton Head, um, Scottsdale, TPC, and the Dallas Cowboy Golf Club. I have these four yardage books. I have not played any of these four courses. I have the stuff, I've just never played that course. So these are courses that I've driven up to, I've gone into the pro shop, I bought the book, but I've never played the game there. Now, they're all amazing courses, beautiful. I mean, this Cowboys Golf Club, I'm sure is great. I'm, I'm a Cowboys fan. Uh, they have a bunker there that's in the shape of the Dallas Cowboys star. Payne Stewart may be one of my favorite pros. He's with the Lord now, but I, I like Branson. It's one of those places. Scottsdale, I, I actually went to this course, and while I was buying the yardage book, um, I, was, I didn't have my clubs with me. And as I'm looking at it, somebody over my shoulder says, are you going to play? I said, man, I, I, no, I don't have time. I'm leaving tomorrow, and I have some meetings today. And he said, well, I'm the assistant golf pro. We're going to play later today. If you can swing by, I've got clubs you can use. In fact, it'll be on me. I couldn't go. I've got the yardage book. Never been there. Then we took my family to Hilton Head. Uh, it was on a trip. I told my family, I've got to go get the yardage book from the Harbor Town Hilton Head course. It's got this cool lighthouse on the course. They play pro events on this course. Never played it. Got the book. I've just never played the game there. When we're talking about reading God's word and trying to find Christ, especially in this year as our church, some of you have the book. You've just never played this game before. You've never got on the course with Christ. You know everything about the yardages, but you've never put it into practice. And so it's great that I have all these books. They're absolutely worthless in my office. Because having and knowing the yardages doesn't make me a better golfer on this course if I never play it. And some of you have a Bible at home that has gathered so much dust, it's become an antique. And it's time to blow off the dust and open his word and learn about Christ. It's time that we start to enact this faith that we say we believe in. It's time to start a new year. Uh, this past week, I did what most of us like to do in a new year. I renewed my gym membership, went to the gym, did my normal routine that I've always done. In particular, I decided that day I was going to work my triceps. I was like, I, I used to be really good with my triceps. And so I, I get in there, I start my same thing, stationary bike, get that sweat going, go over and start working the triceps. And I sit down at this first machine and I go, I remember I used to lift this much, so clink. I went, oh, okay, well, I've gotten a little bit weaker. <sighs> Let's try without weight. Um, I, it wasn't the same anymore because I'd gotten out of practice. And so I was a little bit weaker than I thought I was. And I want to tell you something. Some of you started this week reading with us. 
And I, I know it was five days to read, and you, you might have started two days. And then you went, I just don't know that I can. I want to tell you, don't give up. Don't stop now. You're just beginning to gain that muscle back. Don't stop. And if you missed last week, don't stop now. Start this week with us and keep going with us. I'm telling you, there is something special about as a church body, us spending the time in the Word together. It focuses us. It equips us to do this work in battle together. Don't stop now. Don't just have the book. Play the course. Be known by it. Spend time with the Lord and search for him. And I want you to know something. You're going to find him. He's going to speak into your life and it's going to change you if you will search for him. Don't just read like you're reading some novel. Read knowing that God is about to speak into your life and be ready. He is going to do it. John 1 tells us this, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him and apart from Him not one thing was created that was created. In Him was life and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all may believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people didn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, this is the one of whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Christ or through Jesus Christ. For no one has seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God and his fathers at his father's at the Father's side, he has revealed him. This is a powerful start to a book. It reminds us that we have some hope to hold on to. If you were going to go on a journey into the deepest, darkest part of a a forest or of a jungle, who would you want to guide you? Somebody that's watched a video about it or somebody that's been in the jungle and through the forest all their life? Who knows the ins and outs? Who knows the dangers and the safety measures? I would choose that that had knowledge, that had been there and done that. How about this? How about if you were to go into that forest or that jungle with the person that planted the trees? I mean, that would be somebody worth trusting, wouldn't it? Somebody that knows exactly where that tree was planted and what was there. How about this? How about the person that knows where the snakes are? (laughs) Listen, if you know me, you know there's two things in this world that scare your, your friend. Snakes and taxes. Um, both jump up on you, right? Too soon. We're getting into tax season. I'm sorry. Snakes are awful. But how about the one that knows where they exist? When I was young, I can remember thinking the scariest thing about going into a jungle or a forest was quicksand. Y'all remember that? All the movies told us that if you walked into quicksand, you just sunk down to your neck all of a sudden, unless somebody brought you a vine, you were done. Only to know now that quicksand really isn't that fast. Like if you stepped into quicksand, you could step through quicksand. I always thought it was like, no, quit moving. Right? That's not how it works. It's how we were taught, though. But listen, there's this guy I watched. He was, this is quicksand. 
And he goes, there it was. And I was like, no, 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 that's not quicksand. I've seen the westerns. Y'all remember the westerns? Our hero walks in with his guns on his side, and he steps in quicksand, and he goes, save me. And the other guy goes, I'm so sorry. Come back. And he just, doom, underneath. <laughs> they set a tombstone next to it saying, there died our hero. It was like so tragic and sad. Not how it works. I was so scared of something that didn't work that way. I didn't realize that that's not how it actually happens. I also remember having an unhealthy fear of, of lots of things like, I don't know, snakes falling out of trees. That happens. That's leeches. Ah. I grew up watching movies where you'd go into water, you came out, you're covered in leeches. That happens. Ah. That's why I would want a guide. I would want somebody that goes, you know what, you don't want to go into that water. Leeches are there. You want to know an un, another unhealthy fear? Piranhas. Did you know that piranhas don't instinctively attack? They're scared of humans. What? Like in every bad guy movie, the good guy's captured. The bad guy comes up and goes, So next, we will drop you into the piranhas. They pull back the thing, there's water with piranhas, and they're just like, ah, 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 ah. And he was like, ah, don't drop me. And the last minute he steps out, throws in the bad guy or one of his goons, and ah, 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 they're gone. Not how it works. Piranhas are like, you know what, bro? We're good. I was like, are you kidding me? I thought piranhas bit like this, too. They're like, dee, 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 like that. Unhealthy fears. In this life, isn't it funny that we live mostly in unhealthy fears? But the real fears that exist, we could have a guide that could walk us through it. How many nights have you and I stayed up with unhealthy fears, but the real fears, we don't even know how to tackle those either? It is time that we get a guide for our life, and we can trust Jesus because he has been there since our beginning. From the very beginning, before we existed, before we even understand what was before, he was there. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's the Word? Jesus. He is the guide. So why is it as we as Christians don't spend just immense time with him? It's because we think we're good enough to be our own guide. Let me just tell you something, my dear friend and Christian. We're not. We will never have it together enough that we don't need a Jesus to guide us. We must hold on to a guide that can weather the path with us and tell us, don't go this way, go that way. When I was little, I was riding bikes with my dad and my sister. I was little. I thought I was bulletproof. My dad is riding his bike, and he's with us, and he says, hey, listen, kids, don't go to the right. On the right side, it's really slick. You're going to fall. As a kid riding my cool little BMX bike, I was like, listen, I got this. I can ride my cool BMX bike through anything. So I take off to the right. Now my dad, full of wisdom at this moment, is like, Kyle, stay to the left. And I'm like, <laughs> bam! What did I do? Cried for my mother. My father had failed me. My mother was not there, but she would mend me. So here I am on my bike. My dad's like, get back on your bike. At which point I'm thinking, this bike did me wrong. I know it's slick up here, but it's BMX. The tire tread is thick. I shouldn't fall off a bike. But I got back on. <laughs> All the way home. And when I got home, I go, Mom. I fell off my, my, my bike. My mom's like, oh, Kyle, I'm so sorry. And my dad's going, I told him not to. <laughs> this is a true story. Uh, I, but listen, in your life, how many times have we fallen down spiritually? When God has told us to stay to the left, 
and we keep going to the right. And we fall in time and time and time and time and time and time again. The most amazing thing about it is this. God is still there always. Even when you're laying down in mud. He's like, I'm with you. I've been there. I've seen it. Isn't it amazing to have a Jesus who stands before us and says, I've fallen down in that before. You should avoid it. And if nothing else, we know this about Jesus. While he never tasted sin until the cross, he died for those moments where you've fallen off your bike. He knows exactly what you're going through. There's never a moment that we serve a Jesus that goes, don't understand. I I can't relate. He always relates. He always knows. And he loves us despite the fact that we're going to get back on our bikes and go to the right. Jesus gives us life. And he also leads us to a light-filled life. He shows up when we're broken. That day as they're journeying and they crossed through Samaria, Jesus shows up and he talks to a woman he shouldn't have. She was broken. She was willfully sinning. She was one of those women that even the townspeople probably didn't care for. And Jesus shows up and he's like, listen, I want you to know you came for water and I'm coming to give you life. But to get that life, you've got to leave something at this well. You can't bring your previous history of all the rights you think you've done or all the wrongs you've committed. You have to leave with what I can give you. And she does. She runs to town and she tells everybody about Jesus. And it says that they show up and Jesus spends time with these people and people get saved. All because a broken woman showed up at a time where no one else was there and met a Jesus that shouldn't have talked to her. I want you to know something. There is not a person alive today that Jesus wouldn't talk to. Not one. There isn't a person alive today that's gone too far and is too sinful that Jesus wouldn't touch. I promise you that. So if you came today and you're saying, listen, pastor, you don't know how far I've gone as a person spiritually, all the sin I've committed, my thoughts right now, you don't know. I want you to know something. Jesus loves you. You know why? Jesus loves you. This I know for the the Bible tells me so. What good theology. How can we find a way to love people around us beyond our, our thoughts, beyond our ways, beyond our will How do we love people that we don't love today? Let Jesus do it through us. I want you to know something. In this room today is hatred. Let's admit it. The world tells us that we must hate each other because we're different. Came from different backgrounds, have different ideologies, whatever it is. The world tells you if you're different from the person next to you, you cannot like them. In fact, if you're different, you must hate one another so that you're separated. I want you to know something. Never, ever will Jesus have you hate somebody. He came that you would show love because he is so full of love, he wants you to exhibit that love before everybody. There is no possible way for a Christian to exhibit hate because God so loved the world. If God so loved the world, his church should act like lovers. Sadly enough, though, the world sees us as fighters. Now, I want you to know something. I'm not preaching this so that you will be wishy-washy. I do not believe God's church should be silent on issues. I'm just saying if you yell more than you hug, you've got it wrong. I'm just telling you, if you post more than you serve, you've got it wrong. The church should show up and act like Jesus. You know why? Because we're his. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I mean, at least honor God by how you act. Because you're his or you aren't. And every day we show that. 
We either have the book or we play the course. We have the opportunity to, fe- to testify about the light of Jesus. Matthew 28 is another one of those really well-known verses amongst the church. Jesus is ending his time on earth. He gathers his disciples together. And I love how it starts because I always move beyond this first part of this passage as I read. But in Matthew 28, verse 18, it says this. Jesus came near. I want you to feel this for a moment. His disciples are out and he just kind of goes, guys, come in close. It says, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. I just want to dwell here for a second. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to whom? To Jesus. Not only is he a good guide, he's a good God. With that in mind, Jesus says to them, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus shows up at the appropriate time and does the work that could never have been done without him, a sacrifice that would last for eternity and an offering to join him for the rest of time. You and I are not just called to be a church that sits on our hands and hopes that somebody else does something. We are called to look like Christ. Let me ask you a question. Do you recognize Jesus in our world? Do you recognize him? I, I, I know that our world seems like it's going, I, to use old grandparents' thoughts past to hell in a handbasket. But this world doesn't belong to hell. For God so loved the world. He created the world. He created everything in it. And John 1 tells us that nothing was created that wasn't created through him. Which means that Jesus has the right for all of creation to answer to him. And with all of this in mind... With all of the opportunities before us, with the invitation to serve and belong in Jesus' plan, do we recognize him at all in our world right now? And if we don't, you should change it. You should show up today and look like him and provide another piece of Jesus in our world. I was moved over the past few weeks of watching the media change before my eyes. As an NFL player laid in ICU, critical care, the world began to pray openly. In particular on ESPN, one of their own, in the middle of a broadcast, is talking about prayer, and all of a sudden you could see him turn a page. He said, with all the thought on prayer, I feel like we should pray right now. And I don't know if this is right in a cross where you couldn't see on the screen another guy says, yes, it is. And right on live air, the ESPN announcer prayed openly, on air. I want you to know something, church. We should be found praying like we believe that prayer works. Because when a lost industry starts, the church had better sound louder than ever before. As I looked through these yardage books in preparation for today, all I can see is missed opportunities. I went to the course, but I didn't play it. Could have. Could have sacrificed to do so, but I didn't. They're just pieces of paper that sit in my office that I overpaid for. If tomorrow morning the world wakes up 
and there are no more Bibles, would your life change? Or would you simply wake up and do what you always do? Turn on the news, turn it off and go to work, go to the coffee shop. Without God's word, would it change at all? My challenge to you is this. Live as though today, if you don't spend time in the word, it may be gone tomorrow. You and I are not given any certainties in this life. We don't know the length of our days. But what's more is we don't know about our neighbors, our coworkers, our classmates, or acquaintances. I pray that you would fill yourself with Jesus so that a lost world could recognize him in you. Don't just hold the yardage book. Play the game. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends in this room that don't know you. I pray that today as they heard me challenge our church to spend time in the word that they, had grain, uh, that they would gain a curiosity. That in their life they would simply say, you know what, I, I don't read the Bible, but if they're going to do it, I may join them. God, I pray that you would inspire our church to spend time in your word, to deepen our walk with you, and to not get lost any longer in just ordinary. Lord, you didn't call us to ordinary. You called us to you. And there is nothing ordinary about Jesus. So Lord, would you speak over this place today? If there's anybody in this room that doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, that today would be their day. That they would gain that curiosity and ask the question, how can I know more about Jesus? Lord, I'd love to talk to them about what it means to make Jesus the Savior and Lord of our life. Lord, would you start that conversation now in somebody's heart? Lord, for my friends in this room that do know you, Lord, would you inspire us, lead us, fill us with your presence so that we don't miss opportunities. Lord, that we would seize this moment greatly and wouldn't leave this room without commitment to spending time with you in prayer and in your word and in worship. God, may we never be the same Lord, that we wouldn't just carry around our Bibles like yardage books, but that we would play this game. And Lord, that we would be known as Christians. Lord, in a dark world, would you bring the light that you've always brought, like it says in John 1. And would you inspire us and lead us, Lord, to look like you. You are the light of the world, you tell us. A city on a hill that can't be hidden. So may your church light our world with Jesus. Lord, that's what we pray for. And in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen.